Good afternoon and welcome to today's Ad Week webinar, uh, where we'll be looking at ways you can manage your digital content overload, uh, and especially how that's important in this era where more personalization means more assets. And of course, more assets means it's harder and harder to control how those assets go out. Uh, and our webinar today is being sponsored by SendShare. I'm Stuart File, head of Adweek's branded content studio, and I'm going to be your host for today's webinar. Uh, before we begin, I just want to take a few moments here uh, and make sure that everyone in our audience knows what to expect from today's webinar, uh, and is also familiar with the various features of our webinar platform. Uh, our actual presentation today should go somewhere in the 30, 35 minute range. Uh, afterwards, we are going to have plenty of time for audience Q&A. So if at any point during our presentation, if you have a question for our speakers, uh, just simply use the question tool that you see there on the left side of your screen. Uh, and again, we're going to get to as many audience questions as we can following our live slide presentation. Uh, I'm just going to urge you to ask your questions, uh, and I always tell our audience uh, we often have more questions than we have time to get to, and if that's the case, uh, I always do make sure as well that uh, questions get forwarded to our sponsor, so there's always the opportunity for an offline response. Uh, it's not too late, by the way, to invite your colleagues to join us today, and we'd really love it if they would. Uh, about 15 minutes ago, we sent everyone a final reminder email for today's webinar. In there, you're going to find a link to the registration page, so grab that link, send it off to your colleagues. Uh, I know you just can't grab them and go and have them join you in the conference room, so uh, send it over to them. They've still got time. They can register and join us live, but if they can't make it live, uh, today's webinar is being recorded and will be available uh, on demand, and we're going to send you a link to that on-demand uh, version later this afternoon. Check your email about uh, oh, 3.30 Eastern time today or so. Uh, if you are interested in getting a PDF of today's slides, uh, you can download those right now in the event resources area. Uh, that's a tab that you see up there at the top of your screen. So. Uh, feel free at any point to go on in there and download that PDF. Uh, and lastly, uh, I just want to invite everyone and remind you to check out the Adweek webinar calendar, www.adweek.com slash webinars with an S. Uh, we've got a full schedule coming up. Uh, tomorrow we've got two webinars scheduled. So lots of different topics, everything that you're covering in the world of marketing, uh, the world of advertising, uh, again, the technologies, MarTech, uh, as we're discussing today, uh, issues of identity, connected TV, uh, you name it, we've got webinars on it. So see what's coming up, see what interests you, uh, sign up for an upcoming one. You'll also get full access to our archive of on-demand webinars. That's every webinar that we've done over the past 12 months. So adweek.com slash webinars, check it out. Let's move on to today's webinar and let me just take a second. Uh, and introduce our panel for everyone. We're, we're very excited uh, to be joined today by Teresa Regley. Teresa is uh, a well-known expert on digital asset management, uh, and she's uh, working at her consultancy, Vox Veritas Digital, uh, really one of the leading thought leaders uh, in that area. Uh, she works frequently as uh, both as a consultant or a fractional chief digital officer. She advises many, many top brands and executives uh, and, you know, about uh, DAMS and the broader digital strategy. Uh, you're going to really appreciate her insights today. Uh, we're also very happy to be joined by Francisco Ruiz. Francisco is uh, SVP uh, over at MSphere, where he advises clients on how best to put marketing platforms to work within their specific business context, uh, also helping them manage broader issues around things like, you know, cost justification, adoption, and change management. Uh, and then from SendShare, uh, you're going to learn a little bit here from Jess Polini. Uh, Jess is Senior Marketing Manager, uh, where, you know, in addition to her role in marketing, uh, she also produces and founded the Masters of Content podcast, uh, and she focuses on demand gen and sales enablement, uh, ABM, for those in search of enterprise-level content management. So welcome all of you, and Jess, let me pass this on over to you to start our webinar. 
Thanks so much, Stuart. So hello, everybody. Thank you for joining today. I hope that wherever you're at in this world, you're able to enjoy your St. Patrick's Day, at least as much as we're able to in a pandemic. Um, as Stuart mentioned, I'm Jess Bellini, and I'm happy to be here as the moderator for today's session, which is sponsored by SunShare. Just a quick note about SunShare. We help organizations, typically mid-size to enterprise level, create a content hub for all of their workflows, digital assets, product information, and collateral. So this really enables our clients to produce content more efficiently and then deliver that content to any channel in any language locally or globally. And I'm excited to have with me today a couple of pioneers in the digital asset management space. So first we have Teresa Wrigley, who Stuart mentioned um, has you know, a lot of experience and is a world-renowned digital asset management expert, analyst, and author who has delivered several keynotes all over the world. Um, has also worked with brands such as Ikea, Coca-Cola, Starbucks, and more with their digital strategy needs. And also Francisco Ruiz, who has been in this space for 15 plus years working in marketing technology from high level strategy to hands-on immersion in the details uh, and of configuration and implementation. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Teresa. Thank you very much, Jess. Good day, everyone. Uh, good evening for me, coming to you from London today where it is a sunny evening, and I hope the same is true for you. Um, as Jeff mentioned, I've uh, worked in DAM for a long time, about 17 years, and more broadly with uh, content management technology since 1995. So I've been at it for a while. Uh, I wrote a book on digital asset management about four years ago, and a lot of the content I'm gonna share with you today uh, comes from that book. So if, if DAM is of particular concern to you, if digital asset management is something that you're really looking to learn a lot about, um, please feel free to get in touch um, after this, this webinar. And thanks to SendShare and Adweek for inviting me to be a part of this. So what is digital asset management? Well, it's important to define uh, technologies because there are, of course, so many definitions that get bantied around and uh, there's, there's often misperception in organizations as to what particular technologies can do. Uh, so this is a definition of DAM that I've been using for the last decade plus, and very simply, it is the management of digital media throughout its lifetime. It is very focused on rich media or mostly non-textual assets. Now, that's not to say that text is not involved. It definitely is. That's why I have these examples of some packages uh, for you, some advertising for you for Dub Soap. So it's often a combination of pictures, words, perhaps even animations, of course, audio and video files, which are growing at exponential rates are a big part of digital asset management. But then it's also what I call compound assets. So things like brochures and catalogs, which are still extremely prominent um, in terms of being handed out and mailed uh, picked up in, in various stores, et cetera. There's all different kinds of simple as well as compound assets that we produce, that we manage. And of course, many of you being interested in advertising, uh, you're producing a lot of digital as well as print ads constantly. So DAM is a big player in the technology stack uh, for, for, for what you all do, no doubt. Now, I think the use of the word asset is extremely important because a digital asset is so much more than a file. It's a file plus metadata. It gives it value. And this is why we use the word asset because like a financial asset, it brings value to our organization when it's more than a file. So let's, let's explore how that happens. So a DAM system specifically is a technology that allows you to manage your digital assets. It basically takes your files, it ingests those files. So along the left-hand side of the slide, you see all the different sorts of files that a, a DAM system will typically uh, ingest. And then there's certain functions that allow you to, for example, to associate metadata information to that file, allows you to catalog, allows you to version. So we're talking about different functions that help facilitate not just the creative process, but also preparing digital assets for different channels and different markets, which are along the right-hand side. So, of course, all of you are probably involved in multi-channel distribution of marketing assets and advertising for all kinds of different channels. 
social media, even television, broadcast. And even though we tend to constantly be talking about digital and the impact of digital, there's still a lot of advertising that's, of course, distributed by television and, and, and even print. So DAM is really about true multi-channel. And I think that's a really important thing to remember about DAM uh, as not just as a technology, but also as a, as a discipline and as a, as a practice within organizations. But it's very multi-channel. It's not just about uh, digital channels. So as I mentioned, uh, when does a file become an asset? Well, it becomes an asset when it can be managed through its metadata. And that management isn't just by people. Uh, it's also by systems itself and themselves. So, of course, you can go to a DAM system as a, as a marketer, as an advertiser, and you can search for this particular picture. So you are marketing this beautiful salad um, because you work for a restaurant or a grocery store or something similar. And there's going to be metadata about this particular picture. And maybe you're creating a campaign. And you go into that system and you say, okay, I'm searching for this salad. I'm just looking for spinach and acorn squash and feta and pumpkin seeds whatever I might be wanting to promote in terms of the sale that's coming up next week, for example. So that's wonderful if you're a, a person and can do that. But it's also, in, in the modern marketing technology world, very important for software to be able to do the same thing. So if my web content management system or my marketing uh, automation tool, my email automation tool might need to find that same image without human intervention, perhaps to automate, to speed time to market, they're going to look using the same metadata because you might be doing a campaign about healthy salads. So that's really equally important when it comes to DAM is software as well as people being able to find what they're looking for. And what I've seen in particular over the last five years is what I call the evolution of asset value. And this is where the metadata that we store uh, about our assets isn't just about what is in the picture but it's also about the who and the when and the how. And how might we use this image and, and how would a, would a piece of software that's personalizing and targeting very specific sorts of buyers, how would they find this image and use it? So this particular image would be good to target towards vegetarians, people who buy a lot of salads, uh, perhaps people who want organic food during squash season or when spinach is on sale, all these different sorts of uh, situational uh, criteria, but also what do you know about your customer? What do you know about their buying history? You combine that data that you have, and this allows you to scale, and this allows you to personalize at scale. You can't do that manually, right? You can't have a human being picking this picture of the salad for every single individual salad buyer. You need the software to be able to do it. So this is part of what allows us to personalize at scale is this really specific uh, expansion of, of metadata. So DAM, of course, fits into the much larger marketing technology ecosystem. And, and this is a slide that, uh, that I prepared with a consulting team at a company called ICP. Uh, and I work with them here in London with several mutual clients. And they also have a, a team that's, that's just really trying to um, help clients uh, uncover and, and lay out um, the best possible MarTech stack. You know, and DAM is just a part of the MarTech stack. I like this particular image because it's very similar to the approach that SendShare takes um, when they uh, go into an organization to help uh, manage digital assets. And that is, it's not about DAM in a silo. It's about connecting DAM to a much larger ecosystem of technology. So I could talk about this slide for the entire webinar, but to be brief, uh, you can see the circle um, it's about a third of the way across the slide. Um, that really shows um, the key technologies that need to be connected to DAM for it to be really effective for marketers. So DAM, sure, it can live in a silo, but if you're a product company, for example, it needs to be connected to product information. Uh, if you're a media company, it needs to be connected to digital rights information to make sure you're not misusing the assets in the wrong way. Uh, if you're a creative agency, you need creative project management or marketing resource management technology sort of wrapped around that. And this connective tissue um, of this ecosystem is really perhaps one of the biggest challenges that organizations face today. Um, 
And Francisco, when he talks, and of course, M-Sphere, this is the kind of work they're doing constantly, is they're helping companies actually connect these very complex ecosystems. Uh, but this is what's going to get us to the next level of digital advertising and digital marketing, is, is connecting these pieces of metadata, relating uh, our assets to customer preferences, what we know about our customers, and delivering that in a way that's very specific to different channels. Uh, and this, is, this increases marketing effectiveness exponentially. Again, I could talk about this slide for so long, but I'll, I'll pause there. And if you have more questions about it, um, please feel free to uh, email me later. So let's show um, a few examples of, of, of how I've seen um, digital asset management really help organizations over the years. Uh, the, the biggest business case for digital asset management is, is the one that is often uh, used in, in the damn world, which is a centralized single source of truth. So this shows you a, a, a sort of the default scene here from, or screen, I should say, from, from Sendshare, whereas if I'm putting all of my assets in a centralized place, this allows anyone throughout an organization to go to this place and to be able to find these assets uh, and manage these assets and create campaign uh, collections with these assets, all kinds of different features. So that's really you know, number one, is just get all your assets in a centralized place so that people can find it. And of course, as I mentioned, so software can find it. When it comes to managing advertising, uh, it's, it's interesting because many, many organizations, they think, well, advertise, this is the advert, right? This is the advertisement here. Um, but what can really be powerful as well is when you manage the parts of the advertisement and you can reuse them in different ways. And this is another way that we can scale uh, and that we can uh, reuse more of our assets and reuse more of our content. So this shows you an advertisement here um, sort of broken into its component parts. And one of the glorious things about a DAM system is that if you have this particular advertisement, and it's a layered, say, Illustrator file, uh, you can actually put it in to the system as a layered file, as you see here, and it will actually help you parse and uh, associate the, what I would call the parent asset with its children. Or sometimes we say master slave. I think parent and child is a more pleasant expression. Uh, but what you see is you have the whole asset, um, but you've got the shot of the actual product. And then you've got the logo, you know, which is Hellman's. And then you've got the background, which is a completely different uh, illustration. You've got some textual elements. Uh, you've got a sub-brand or a logo. So there's a specific barbecue sauce that is you know, part of Hellman's. You've got text all kinds of different elements here. And part of what helps us speed up the production of advertising is this sort of, of really uh, good management on the part of uh, advertisers and marketers, but putting it all in the DAM system where you can associate uh, the whole ad with the sum of its parts. Uh, just a few more examples here that I'll show you from, uh, from, from Sendshare's application. So you've got here uh, what this might look like in a DAM system if I'm putting together product imagery and product data. So this is a, um, really a dashboard, a sort of marketing content hub that comes together where I can see not just the product picture, but the marketing content, the different parts uh, that are associated in terms of color, in terms of characteristics. And I can even show the same version, look at that in German. So as we think about scalability, as we think about localization. Again, we cannot do that manually. And historically, as marketers and advertisers, we've done too much manually. We've done too much just sort of opening Photoshop and resizing and then typing in a different language and copy pasting. All that needs to end or else we're not going to get to the next level of marketing. Uh, but you see here, okay, we've got the English version, we've got the German version, and we can produce that and export it and output it at scale. So I talked about multi-channel distribution. Uh, what I believe is, is important and the way that all the, the largest global brands I'm working with are, are really doing this is that it's enabling these, these systems, uh, these damn platforms are enabling us to produce and publish by providing methods for assets to be shared, linked to, distributed. And DAM is just one part of that. It has to be part of a bigger stack. Uh, and that's, that's um, the key to our really, really our future as, as more effective marketers and advertisers. One thing that DAM systems do really well is they convert for specific channels. So if you have a 4K video and you need to convert it to a different format, DAM systems can do that at scale across channels. No one has to do that manually. It can detect where it's going and it can convert for you on the fly. 
And then I'll just wrap up before I hand it over to Francisco with my advice for a successful DAM program. And it's very important. I believe DAM is a program and a practice. It is not just a technology. So enterprise DAM, often people think that's just a big enterprise spending lots of money and that is not correct. It is a strategy and a mindset. So I specifically put a sort of enterprise in quotes here because if that is open for interpretation. You can be a 50 person organization and you can have an enterprise dam if you do these things. So in addition to buying a good product, you need to have solid governance. You need to make sure that you have executive sponsorship. You need to have clear direction and approach it as a platform rather than just a product. You can, you can use systems like Sendshare in so many different ways. They're so flexible and they're so open that you can do many, many things for your enterprise. Uh, you need to avoid using the dam as a destination just for users, but rather as a service that enables the enterprise where different software products can go and get what they need. Make sure you have a vision. Make sure you keep everybody on the same page. Take the dam beyond the creative and marketing departments. It should be a tool for everybody in your organization to find digital assets and to find marketing assets. Make sure you have well-aligned data and metadata across the dam and your many other systems and make sure you focus on interconnectivity and enablement. Connecting systems uh, is the future to better personalization. Uh, and with that thought, I will hand it over to Francisco. Thank you, Teresa. And it's uh, great to be with, every, with you here this afternoon. I'm coming to you from Atlanta in Georgia in the United States. And uh, I thought I would continue on this uh, theme of what it takes to build a successful dam, because that is, as a consultant, what I have been doing for the last many years and what many of my colleagues here at MCU have been doing. And uh, one thing, you know, to unpack that, it's, it's often helpful to figure out, well, okay, we're trying to build a successful dam, but what does that really mean? And uh, what I encourage uh, uh, organizations to think of is, well, start at the end and ask yourself, what are you really trying to achieve? And I think there's two things. And uh, the first is that you're not really just standing up a dam. You're actually trying to build an operational system of record for the entire enterprise. And I think that that means at least three things. The first is the dam has to be complete. It should be the single source of truth for all assets across all teams. Those assets should be absolutely accurate, error-free uh, files and metadata that are pro properly taxonomized and fully compliant at all levels. And that's actually critical. It needs to pass brand standards, internal compliance standards, and regulatory standards uh, as a lot of industries require those. And then a final piece is that it has to be current, meaning it has to be the repository of the latest and active versions so that expired assets are controlled and archived uh, appropriately and that usage rights are honored. So that's the first thing. The next thing that I think we need to achieve is that we're not just building dam capabilities, features and functions. We're actually driving for enterprise-wide adoption of that operational system of record. And that means it has to be engaging to users and it has to generate participation and feedback from the user community. And it should be supremely helpful to them. The reality is you can't really mandate adoption Adaption will follow if users believe it is helpful, and they'll believe that if they find that they are better off with it than without it. So with that said, if this is what we're trying to achieve, well, how do we actually do that? And uh, the way I, I encourage large organizations to think of this is, first of all, who are you targeting? What constituencies or audiences are you trying to serve? And one way of thinking about this is just employing the uh, entrepreneurial framework, the Jeffrey Moore crossing the chasm, because there is a sequence here from the very first constituency, which would be your core team, which are the, the core uh, group of, of individuals who are going to carry this initiative forward, not just during an implementation, but over the long, uh, the long term. Uh, those are, in effect, your innovators. Then you go to your early adopters who are your content creators and content contributors. These are the people that are going to upload and uh, ingest uh, assets into the dam. And then you cross the chasm because going from those early adopters, which could be dozens of users, to the mainstream, which is, is your majority, is quite a bit different. These are the constituencies that are going to be consuming those assets. 
people from inside your organization, the internal consumers, and people even from outside of your organization, external consumers. And then there's actually a second chasm, which as Teresa mentioned earlier, uh, this is uh, a dam system is not just users accessing these, but oftentimes you are publishing and distributing assets to other systems and platforms, namely websites or e-commerce sites that you might own, your own properties, or placements on social media or syndication channels. So that integration and automated publishing and distribution to, uh, to those systems uh, is what really completes the, the, the audiences here. And notice that those come last because they tend to be uh, dependent on having everything else done and in place uh, to be able to do that successfully. So um, the next thing you need to focus on is, well, what are the key factors of success? And this is where I'd like to spend just a little bit of time here uh, with you today, that for each of these constituencies, there are basically a series of very important things that need to be in place in a particular sequential order um, for them to be successful, right? And these key factors are across 10 dimensions, which can be grouped across three different categories. There's some foundational elements that have to be in place. Then there's some solution-oriented elements. And finally, there's some conformity-oriented elements. So let's talk about these uh, for a little while. So for the first uh, constituency, the core team, as you'll notice here, shaded in red, from a foundational standpoint, uh, the core team is going to be absolutely instrumental because this is where the specification, the taxonomy, and the metadata structure itself, it really needs to be defined up front. Also, the processes, the, the processes for new asset ingestion, new asset revision, that sort of thing, and the security model. I highly encourage organizations to think about the permission and security model up front as opposed to as an afterthought. And of course, enabling all this is the core team itself, the resources. And there, of course, you wanna have uh, the right leadership in place, you wanna have the right sponsorship, but the skills is the key factor here. Skills that mean that they are very uh, conversant in the business processes and uh, you know, the, the business practices of the organization, but also that they know the minutia of the platform inside and out because as you build out your dam, you really have to do it in context of both the users and the underlying enabling platform. So that's the first piece and uh, getting the core team to really nail down these foundational elements up front is absolutely critical. And if you get it wrong there, it'll cast a pretty long shadow. The next piece here is to uh, get uh, the content creators and contributors on board. And I think here you notice that versioning is in red. And what I mean there is that for creators and contributors, the single most important thing is how do they upload assets into the, uh, into the uh, dam and how do they upload revisions to those assets? In other words, the first revision and subsequent revisions. So studying how they work and being able to put uh, the you know, upload into dam inside the context of where they work, inside of Adobe InDesign, for example, that's gonna be absolutely critical. And the way to do that is actually to rely heavily on automation. And by that, I mean structured automated workflow. The idea is you have a production process and you can basically uh, invoke tasks for contributors or creators to complete and therefore upload the asset and the corresponding metadata for that asset at that moment in time. And then, of course, governance. This is where it starts to creep in and where you start building in governance. But here, what you're trying to do is basically put in gates and review uh, tasks and review moments or milestones inside that automated uh, workflow so that content creators basically, they're, they're almost like alerted. It is time for you to you know, check off on all these things. Did you upload this metadata or that? So the, uh, the governance is in, in fact, is in fact infused inside the workflow that enables the, the uploading and the versioning. Now for the next constituencies, these are the consumers. Now we're talking you know, hundreds and potentially even thousands of users. And as you can imagine, the single most important thing to be successful with, the, with, this, with these constituencies is um, discovery, search. 
Of course, that depends on the metadata that was uh, in input earlier during the, the creation cycle, but it also needs to be enriched. So, um, you know, you want full robust uh, metadata so that consumers can find the assets, but you also need to optimize the search indices themselves and search algorithms. And you also need to make sure that the sun setting is probably set, meaning you don't want to serve up expired assets or assets that have been replaced by a subsequent version. So uh, in order to make the, uh, the, the, the discovery absolutely robust, you also will need sunsetting and of course, governance. And by governance here, it's a little bit different than for the previous constituencies. Here, I highly recommend, and I'd like to insist, but I'll leave it up to all of you, but uh, please uh, you know, put in the budget to get a librarian. It's absolutely instrumental to have that role, somebody to basically look after uh, the dam, particularly when hundreds of thousands of users are descending on it, to make sure the assets are in the right place, that if there's an exception, that they can remedy missing uh, metadata, or if that the automation and all that didn't pick up and uh, didn't sunset an asset, they, can, they, they are alerted to that. Uh, so that's absolutely critical, that level of librarian-oriented governance particularly when um, large numbers of consumers are, are using it. And a final piece there is sec the security model. And this is imperative at this level, so first of all, because you're not exposing all assets to all consumers. Your internal users will have access to some assets while external consumers would have access to some subset of that. But the other thing is by the security model, you can conditionally present, meaning the, how the asset is actually presented to these consumers. And to get some of that personalization that Teresa mentioned earlier, this is exactly how you do it. A lot of that is conditional on the security model, which is why you want that security model defined up front. So now I'm going off uh, to the final constituencies, and these are not really people, they're actually systems and um, and, uh, and other platforms, websites, that kind of thing. As you can imagine, the single most important thing there is distribution and automation. By distribution, I mean automated integration and publication to websites, e-commerce sites, social media sites, syndication channels, that kind of thing. And the automation that has the triggers so that upon certain events, certain assets get distributed to certain uh, properties, and that happens and uh, you know, not just with one trigger, but maybe that cascade of triggers. And of course, the sunsetting of old expired assets that then get replaced, all of that also should happen by, uh, with an automation engine. So those are the key things that would make uh, you know, uh, distribution to properties and placements absolutely successful, which is that automation engine. So, um, now, just to, to wrap up uh, this discussion, over time, you know, how, how do you make sure you, you build a successful dam and that it stays that way? And this notion of, you know, I always encourage organizations, it's not just to ask these questions one time, but continually monitor these. And, and that's, there's two sorts of questions. The first is, well, how is that operational system, system of record and a single source of truth, how is it doing? Is it kind of fading over time? Are there assets that, just aren't accurate over time. And then you should continually monitor adoption, run surveys, uh, measure sentiment, and get feedback. Because uh, if people aren't embracing it, governance, again, it's not, you need it, it's absolutely necessary. But uh, you know, if users are not demanding it over time, it will fade. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty straightforward. It has to be helpful to them. And the way to gauge that is by monitoring adoption over time. And then if you do discover uh, issues with either the single source of truth notion or adoption, then ask yourself, well, are there clear deficiencies on any of those critical factors that we talked about? Did you skip some or some missing or some out of sequence? And then uh, as you build it, your dam out, you don't do it all in one shot. Well, what should you build next? Who is the next constituency? You could be all fully adopted at the internal consumer level, but maybe you want to push out to outside consumers. Well, what will that take and how do you plan for that? 
And then a final piece here is, um, are you leveraging an enterprise work management platform? Something like a, an automated workflow platform, a lot of DAM systems have that embedded in it already, like SunShare, for instance. And there are other platforms out there that do that particularly well, project management staff, uh, uh, platforms, Workfront, for instance, which also uh, works very nicely in conjunction with, with SendShare and other platforms. So are you leveraging those because of that automated workflow I mentioned earlier? So uh, you should. You should leverage those capabilities. They will really, uh, I think, satisfy your user audience and increase the likelihood of uh, you you know, being successful over the long term. And now, uh, Stuart, back to you for questions. Great. Well, thank you, Francisco, and, and thank you, Teresa, for sharing these great insights. Uh, I'm sure for some pretty eye-opening information for people who may or may not know a lot about digital asset management these days. Uh, we're going to move into some audience questions in just a second here. So I just want to take a moment and, again, invite everyone who's in attendance, if you do have a question, uh, really anything about digital asset management for our speakers, uh, just simply use the question tool that you see there on the left side of your screen. We can get to as many as we can over the next 10 minutes or so. Uh, I also just want to provide a couple quick reminders here for everyone. Uh, first up, if you want a copy of today's slides and get a lot of information in there that maybe you want to go back to, uh, you can download a PDF of the slides right now uh, from the event resources area. You should see that tab up at the top of your screen. So go on in there. You can download a PDF of today's deck. Uh, also, today's webinar has been recorded and will be available on demand, and we're sending you a link to that on-demand version, oh, about 3.30 Eastern time today. It's part of the thank you email you're going to get from us. So uh, grab that link. Feel free to share it with your colleagues, uh, or better yet, have your colleagues register. We'll send them that link uh, directly uh, once the recording is available. So uh, again, feel free to share that if you've got colleagues who you think are going to benefit from some of the information that was shared today. So let's get into these questions and uh, you know, let's just sort of start off as, as, as we think this stuff through. Uh, you know, and, and those just starting off uh, with digital asset management. And again, we've got two really good consultants here, but Teresa, let's just sort of start with you on this. And as you've got someone uh, you know, just getting started uh, with, a, with a new uh, digital asset management initiative, what specifically you know, might you recommend? Uh, and then, of course, once we're done with Teresa, Francisco, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that one as well. Uh, you know, my first piece of advice is don't rush and buy a technology right away. Uh, that's probably the biggest mistake I see people make. They, uh, they immediately will look at a, um, you know, review ratings, and then they'll, they'll go out and drop a million dollars on a piece of technology without um, getting their act together first. So you need to start with a business case. You need to start with understanding exactly what kinds of problems you're trying to solve. Uh, you, you need to make sure you have the, the management um, behind you. You need to make sure you have the budget. Uh, it also really helps to think about um, metadata and some of the the details of how your future system will fit in with other uh, parts of the ecosystem. You need to determine all of that and, and get all that in place before you buy anything. So make sure you have a strategy, make sure you have a business case, and then you can think about buying a system. Got it. And um, Francisco, what, what, what's your sort of, uh, someone getting started, what, what's the, the stuff that you would recommend? Yeah, I'm just continuing those, the, the great thoughts that uh, Teresa just mentioned. The first is, uh, again, don't buy the software. So couldn't agree more with that, uh, not, at least not yet. But decide what your destination is. Know where you're going before you start, right? And that is the idea of getting clarity and consensus across all the teams that will use this long term to make sure that uh, everybody, you know, has, has a sense of, yeah, if you build that, I'll, I'll, I will play ball. I will, I will embrace it. That, that's helpful to me. So know which ultimately what the end game is for all targeted constituencies. The other thing I would say is that core team. Um, it's, uh, you know, it, it certainly there's leadership involved there. It has to be, you know, uh, sponsored at the highest levels. This is an enterprise class initiative typically. 
but uh, the skill set involved. And it's that, that combination of, you know, being, being a little bit of a poet, knowing the business side and knowing the, you know, the subtleties of how teams and various groups work, but also being, you know, uh, something I wouldn't say you have to be an engineer, but knowing the platform or knowing the technology. Uh, this notion that it has to, the solution has to be the business processes mapped inside the enabling platform, and it has to be in context. So, you know, if you ultimately, if you want to be successful, know as much as you possibly can, at least the core team, um, about dam systems in general, and the two or three you might be considering, really learn as much as you can about that in your context. Ask, ask the vendors to, to display scenarios, you know, not the canned demos, but the scenarios that are in, you know, give them use cases that they can, so to, you need to be able to see yourself in the target platform. And the core team is going to be instrumental to, to making that happen. Yeah. Francisco, you know, you're, you're mentioning uh, teams and, and it's sort of a, a nice transition to another of these questions here, which is someone was sort of asking, you know, who should be involved. And, and while you covered a lot of that, right, your recommendation on librarian and things like that, uh, I think as this person's also looking at it, uh, it's, you know, as they're, they're making their, their damn decision, uh, it never sounds good. It always sounds, I'm sure it's tough with them making their damn decision. Uh, but as, as they're doing that uh, and they're deciding on digital asset management, who should really be involved, right, from a, from a team point of view? Because you've got, you know, you've got creators, you've got users, you've got the technology side of the business. Uh, so, so who do you see as sort of like if, if you're putting together that sort of cross-functional team, uh, who needs some representation at the table to make this decision? Okay, a fantastic question. And uh, first of all, the core team is, you know, the, the core project team, and that's the, the kernel, the nucleus, uh, the project manager, and, uh, you know, the, the people that are going to know as much as possible about everything, right? But then there's subject matter experts, right? So there's people that are involved from all the various other departments and other groups that you just mentioned. They don't have to be full-time members of the core team, but they're subject matter experts that certainly need to be brought in and be ancillary or adjunct adjunct members. Um, and and you need that consist that consensus across all of those, so that you know that core team is is almost like a virtual little. Uh, I mean, it's a transformational initiative, and you should uh, get as much input and representation from as many different, well, all the constituencies as possible up front. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you need to dedicate them full time to the initiative. That would just be the core team, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, Teresa, let's uh, let's change direction here. As as you were presenting, uh, we did get a question that came in uh, that was asking, you know, about using digital asset management. Uh, related to sort of versioning of packaging design. Uh, I would gather, especially as, as more and more brands are out there, as, as more things are global, uh, there's different packaging requirements, uh, different information. Uh, knowing all that stuff has got to be important. Uh, but do you, is that a natural extension of where you're going with digital asset management? It is where it's, I would say, slowly been going. Uh, it, it's not historically really been used to manage packaging, but uh, as the scope of DAM goes more towards creative operations and uh, more collaboration with agencies, there is there is more of that happening, and and I think that's driven by uh, two things. One is is the technology factor, which is this very good connections between DAM systems and creative tools and creative production tools like uh, like Photoshop and even uh, video platforms, etc. But specifically for packaging, of course, it's it's um, it's the it's the Adobe Creative Suite, um, but it's also I think being driven by the fact that marketers want the preview of what's going on a little bit earlier. You know, they want to be able to see well what's the package going to look like. I want to start designing that campaign. I want to start designing that shelf talker for the uh, you know for the for the store. Uh, so those two factors I think are are, are driving that. Um, I will say not a lot of dams support 3D yet. Uh, that's something that a lot of them are, are working on. It is something that Venture does uh, already very well. Uh, so you can actually have that 3D packaging and rotation experience within, uh, within your dam, uh, which of course helps facilitate if you are going to manage your, your packaging development uh, in the system. So the, all that is, is, um, is, is tending people towards 
managing more packaging in dam systems. Got it. Um, n another question just to, to send your way here, Teresa, uh, and that's, you know, understanding sort of but creation, you obviously, you know, you focused a lot on, on, on the use of metadata uh, and the tagging that goes on. Uh, and I'm sure, uh, particularly as, as we've got these huge volumes of, uh, you know, of, of, of imagery, of, of, of text, of asset, of logo, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, you know, tagging all of that, uh, you know, is obviously we, we need to get away from some of the manual processes. Can you talk a little bit about how sort of there, there's automation is working in this day and age and uh, you know, are, are the sort of the AI solutions that work in that area, or are they accurate? Sure. Uh, and, you know, what's, what's sort of the best way to sort of really get a hold of that tagging? Sure. Uh, there, there's a lot of uh, what I would call auto tagging services. I know we might, we might put that in the category of artificial intelligence, but it's not really um, very intelligent. It's just doing pattern matching, essentially. Um, so it's very straightforward. Uh, and, and what these, these services help you do uh, is they essentially will uh, identify you know, what is in a picture. Uh, and, and that could include a logo, that could include uh, a car. It could, uh, if you have a more um, sort of advanced approach to it, it could identify more than just the car. It could identify the model and make of the car as an example. Uh, but what that takes though is, is not just relying on it out of the box. So um, there's these services available from Microsoft, from Amazon, and all the dam vendors tend to use ones that are uh, third party, they exist as, as part of cloud services. And, and what you have to do and work with your, with your vendor to do is really train that, that auto tagging service. So I have had some clients, you know, I use that car example because, um, you know, I know that, that uh, you know, I have had one client that was a, an automotive client and they were able to train the AI service to identify the make and the model of the cars in the images rather than just the fact that a car was in the image. Because of course, that's not very useful if you're an automotive company to just have a lot of metadata that says, oh, there's a car in this image. Uh, so it's, it's really about um, giving a sample set of imagery to uh, a cloud service and essentially training it to be able to identify based on specific criteria what's in that image. And that can, of course, um, speed up uh, your tagging services, but it, it takes time to do that. It takes training to do that. And it takes people who really, um, uh, frankly, can have a, have a good collaboration with, with the vendor to, to tailor that to what you need. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we've got time for maybe one more question here. And, and Francisco, let me sort of send this one your way. Uh, and that is, you know, we, we talked, and I, I think you sort of, as you were going through sort of your execution uh, of digital asset management, can we talk a little bit about sort of how do you measure sort of the success of your uh, implementation, right? Are there specific metrics uh, that, or, you know, other KPIs that should be used uh, as, as part of sort of understanding uh, how, how you ultimately want to approach your 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 digital asset management execution? Uh, sure, excellent question. And I typically do that um, across the two dimensions, right? N number one is metrics to gauge how well you're doing across that operational system of record, that single source of truth to, um, imperative, and also how you're doing against adoption. So for the operational system of truth, that dimension is actually easier to measure from a, just a absolute precision standpoint, right? So how many uh, expired assets are still in the system or have not been sunsetted? Uh, how many, how many uh, you know, successors have, have, have or have not been properly replaced with the, with the expired asset, that kind of thing? Um, you know, what else can you do there? Um, you know, what percentage of the total uh, assets are actually in the dam? And remember, uh, a dam is not just a repository for images. There's, you know, when you're doing publishing or you're doing, you know, a web, uh, an e-commerce site, there's copy, there's fine print, there's all kinds of regulatory filings, that kind of stuff that should be in there as well. So this notion of what percentage of completeness and accuracy um, is is currently maintained in the dam. So there's a whole bunch of just absolute, you know, precise metrics you can do there. On the adoption side, it's a little harder to measure definitively because obviously you're trying to measure sentiment 
And what I always try and get at there is proxies for, is it helpful? Is it so helpful that people demand it and people feel that they're better off with it than without it? So going into the DAM initiative, the kinds of questions and kinds of survey uh, uh, metrics that I would try and do periodically, like every quarter or so, is, um, is this better than what we used to do, right? Um, how, many, how many times a day do you use it? Have you, have you been using it for all your acid ingestions, that sort of thing? Um, feedback, uh, how much, you know, how, how many more, you know, suggestions, you know, what's missing from the, from the solution footprint that is absolutely necessary for you to be successful at your job, that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, you're just trying to gauge that, that sentiment. And the other thing to put in there is, um, from a governance standpoint, um, you can run a lot of metrics about how many of the, of the governance stipulations, both brand standards, compliance, and even regulatory requirements are currently uh, checked off on your assets. That's on the, uh, you know, to make sure you're absolutely legal from all st standpoints. And you can run those metrics pretty clear. You have your governance checklist and you can compare that against every asset and see what is in compliance and what is not. And you can run that metric very uh, uh, precisely, you know, once a quarter across all assets. Great. Well, Francisco uh, and Teresa, I want to thank both of you for great presentation uh, and also for taking some time and answering some audience questions. We are running out of time here. Uh, also, of course, I want to thank Jess Polini uh, from our sponsor, SendShare, as well as sort of our, our early on moderator uh, today. Uh, up on the screen, I have put uh, some contact information here for SendShare. Uh, you can also get this uh, if you download the slides. Uh, you can just click on that link and that'll take you over to the send share site uh, so you guys can learn more uh, so again just uh, want to provide a few quick final reminders here again uh, download you can download the deck you're going to find that in event resources uh, had a couple people still asking is the webinar recorded and the answer of course is yes uh, and we're going to send you a link to that recording oh in about 3 30 eastern time today once it's uh, it's up on the site so keep your eyes out for that uh, and lastly, adweek.com slash webinars, our webinar calendar. See what we've got coming up. Sign up for an upcoming webinar or check out the full archive of on-demand webinars as well. Uh, so again, uh, I want to thank our speakers and I want to thank our sponsor today, SendShare. Uh, I want to thank our audience for taking time out of your busy day. And we look forward to seeing everyone at an upcoming Adweek webinar. <laughs>